Hello, hello, hello. It is 12 noon in freezing tundra Chicago. And welcome to 2018. Welcome to this live webinar. We're totally live. Uh, it is uh, 1201, so we're going to get started. I promised this would only be 59 minutes. My goal is to make it the best 59 minutes you're going to have this week, perhaps this whole year, though that's a pretty big promise. Uh, I want to get started and just make sure everyone can see and hear me okay. So do me a favor, type in the chat box and just tell me where you are from. Just tell me the city you're from. <clears throat> and if you can hear me okay, that would be great too. And then we are going to get started. We do one of these calls every month. Last month we had uh, two from Australia, uh, which was great. So right now I see Hartford, Houston, Los Angeles, uh, Tennessee, California, a few Chicago's, go Chicago. Great, so we're gonna get started. Thanks so much for spending some time together. Uh, like I said, I'm Jeff Hyman, and you're in the right place if you wanna learn the 10 sins of recruiting. And I call them sins because they're committed. These are things that your company is probably doing. I can't say you're doing all of them, but I guarantee you're doing at least three of them. I see the same mistakes over and over. And in addition, I'm gonna reveal the secret of how to headhunter proof your company. What do I mean by headhunter proof? Well, I'm a headhunter. So I'm calling your best people. In fact, I probably spoke to some of them this morning. I'm going to teach you how to make sure they say no and hang up the phone on me. Why am I telling you that? I'm not sure. I'm just a nice guy. And uh, so we're going to have some fun with it over the next 59 minutes. So with that said, uh, this is what we're trying to avoid. I am on a mission. My mantra is no bad hires. So my hope is that if I can help you avoid even one bad hire in 2018, you're going to be far better off for it. I know that you know the statistics. A bad hire costs you three times their annual salary. So $100,000 mistake costs you $300,000. Huge. And if it's a salesperson or someone touching the outside world, they are pissing off customers, prospective customers. They're losing engagement from other outside parties, people you may never be able to win back. So a bad hire is what we're seeking to avoid. Now, I can't guarantee that we can get you to zero, zero bad hires. But here's what I can tell you. 50% of new hires don't work out, and you'll do dramatically better at the end of this one hour together. And this is really what we're trying to avoid. How many of you can identify with this, right? You hire someone, you think they're gonna be a rock star, you get them in seat, and within weeks, you're micromanaging them. You're motivating them. You're trying to figure out why are they coming to late work, uh, to work late? Uh, all kinds of issues that bad hires cause. And, 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 and I, I've seen this transformation time and time again with companies, with my clients. I know that it can be done. It doesn't, it, it is hard, but, but it, it, it is simple, but not easy. Right, So it's simple to do. We're gonna talk through these 10 things over the next few minutes, but it's not easy because it takes constant reinforcing and repeating over and over. It's like any skill that you improve at, but if you're a CEO or a founder or head of HR, or maybe you're a headhunter yourself or a head of sales, if you can get good at this, the big issues in business largely take care of themselves. And who likes this conversation, right? The, the, this is the, the worst part of business probably, which is the it's time to part ways conversation. And if you can avoid bad hires, you can avoid fires as well. And I know no one likes having this conversation. So I'm going to help you get out of that situation as well. Now imagine what life looks like if your company is filled with rock stars. You make your numbers consistently every month. You impress your investors. Your board of directors is happy with you. Uh, you have your weekends to yourself, right? Because you can delegate and trust that your team will get the job done. You'll execute flawlessly. You'll just sleep at night. Now, I know that's a big promise, but think about it. 
If you recruit a team of rock stars at your company who flawlessly execute a great, creative, impassioned, energized workforce, you're unstoppable. And I can promise that your competitors aren't doing it. So it becomes a big competitive advantage. So like I said, I'm Jeff Hyman. For those of you that I haven't had the opportunity to meet, I run an executive search firm in based in Chicago. We work nationally. It's called Strong Suit. And i um, happy to spend this time with you and, and share with you a bit about uh, what I've learned. So I'm also going to give you a little free something just for spending 59 minutes of your time with me. I don't want you to walk away empty handed. I think you're going to like what I have in store for you, but we'll get to that towards the end. So you want to stick around for that. In the meantime, let me just give you 60 seconds about myself just so you understand uh, the perspective. I certainly don't have all the answers. I have made every mistake in the book. That's why you see this receding hairline and gray hair. Uh, but I've been in and around the executive search business for 25 years. I've actually added up all the hires I've been involved in, and it's over 3,000. So I've either done the search or in my four startup companies, I've hired obviously a lot of people, raised a lot of money. I started my career at two of the big executive search firms, Hydric and Struggles, and then Spencer Stewart. So I was kind of formally trained on how to do this, but along the way, found that you know there's always ways that you can improve. Uh, I'm also a professor at the Kellogg School of Management in Evanston, Illinois, uh, where I teach a course called Recruiting and Retaining Talent in Growth Companies. It's the first uh, recruiting course uh, taught uh, at Kellogg. And as of last month, I'm actually a best-selling author of the book Recruit Rockstars, which is the 10-step process to find the winners and ignite your business, which is what we're gonna talk about over the next few minutes. So with that said, I just wanna do one quick sound check uh, to make sure that I'm not talking into the echo chamber. So just type in the chat box, if you will, yes or no, do you think this will help you? Do you think if you build a team of rock stars that it could dramatically change your business results for 2013? And if so, I'm gonna give you all the answers for free. So it's not gonna cost you a nickel, but just type in the chat box whether you think it's gonna help you in 2018 or not. Okay, great. Everyone's on board, so let's go. Let me give you a couple of facts and then we're gonna dig into these 10 cents. One out of every two new hires doesn't work out. Can you believe this? The national average is 50%. 50% of new hires don't work out. The average person is gone within 18 months. You could basically skip your entire recruiting process, flip a coin and get the same level of accuracy which is maddening to me because there's no other part of business where that kind of acceptance rate would be tolerated, 50%. Now, like I said earlier, I can't get it to 100%. I've never seen anyone that's perfect, but I consistently see companies that go from 50% up to 90% accuracy. Think about the impact it could make on the business. Just imagine that. Second fact, two thirds of growth companies fail due to people problems, more than product market fit, more than poor sales execution, more than it's too expensive, more than anything else, technology failures. Most companies fail because of people problems. Co-founders don't get along, you hire the wrong people, the culture is dysfunctional or cancerous, and yet most people don't spend anywhere near as much time on their talent strategy. Sure, they have a sales strategy, you got a product strategy, uh, you got a marketing strategy, you may have a fundraising strategy, but I ask you to email me a copy of your talent strategy and I bet I'll never hear from most of you. So this is fact two, and it's the reason that most companies fail. Number, did I miss one? Here we go, oh, we'll go to the next one. It's never been harder than it is right now to recruit rock stars. We are at 4.1% unemployment in the US for college educated knowledge workers. We are at 2% unemployment. So we're basically at full employment. So if you were around during the dot-com boom of the 90s, you kind of know what I'm talking about, but it hasn't been this bad in a while. And what that means is that you're going to be lucky to recruit rock stars if you go about it the wrong way. You're going to recruit maybe some B and C players, but finding any is hard to do. The good news is that most people, as of a new study this morning on Glassdoor that I just saw, 80% of people are open to opportunities. So most people are working but unhappy, and that gives you a great opportunity to really improve and beef up your team 
this year. And then finally, at a personal level, forget about your business results. At a personal level, if you want to become a business rock star, maybe you want to be CEO one day or you want to start a company funded by professional investors, you have simply got to master recruiting rock stars. It wasn't until I began to study and learn and make all these mistakes and fix them that I began to really see the impact it can make on a business. So if you see a career path for yourself, you're going to have to learn this uh, this skill, recruiting rock stars. Now, what do I mean by rock star? Well, because because I hate fuzzy terms. You know, people say a player, high performer, whatever, and and, and I I'm just that's just too squishy for me. So what the way I define it, and and you can come up with your own definition if you want. I think mine's pretty good. Is a rock star is a top five percent performer. So that means one out of 20 people available for this given opportunity is a rock star at, and this is important, at the compensation level that I can afford to pay. So if I can afford to pay $100,000 for a particular opportunity and there's someone better, but they're 150, I don't, I don't consider them a rock star. It's not viable. I'm never going to land them. But if I can get someone at the top 5%, that is a game changer. Now think about a rock star. You've worked with rock stars before, before, maybe today. They are game changing people, right? You'd rather have one of them than five B players or 10 C players. And you can afford to pay them a little bit more, not crazy, but you can afford to pay a little bit more because they deliver two times, three times. Some studies show 10 times the level of results and productivity and sales numbers or whatever it may be that a B or C player does. So they are game changers. Now, at the same time, I believe there's a lid for every pot. So I'm not saying that 5% of the United States are rock stars and everyone's not. What I'm saying is for a given role, for a given opportunity at a given company, not everyone is going to be a rock star in that role, obviously. So we're looking for, for the only the 5%. And we're never, ever, ever, ever settling for less than that. So just type in the chop, chat box. If you kind of agree with that definition or if you're comfortable, if we can use that definition for the rest of the call, uh, just type in the chat box yes or no that a rock star is a top 5% performer. Does that seem like the kind of goal that makes sense? Okay, people are starting to type. I see a lot of dot, dot, dots. Yes, yes, yes. A lot of yes, of course. Roger, yes. Okay, good. So top 5%, that's our aspiration. Now, keep in mind what most companies do. They settle for B players. Because we're in a tight labor market and because most companies don't think about a talent strategy or hiring ahead of the curve or building a pipeline, they fall prey to just-in-time hiring. And then the pressure's on and you are more likely to settle for a warm body, a B player, someone who's at the 80th percentile, and that's the beginning of the end. Okay? So with that said, let's get right into it. We're going to spend the next half hour or so. We're going to go through these 10 steps. And then, of course, I'll save uh, Q&A uh, for the end. So here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about what most people do. And then we're going to talk about what I'm strongly imploring you, urging you, if I could reach through the screen and grab you by the collar to do. And if you do these things, we can improve our accuracy from 50% to 90% accuracy. Huge, huge impact. So with that said, let's go to deadly sin number one. Of course, most people don't even stop to think about what it is they're looking for. Okay? So they are sloppy or lazy or too busy, all of which I guess are understandable. And so they say, well, I'll know it when I see it. I've hired a lot of people before, and I'm just going to get me some resumes and start interviewing and blah, blah, blah. And I'll know it when I see it. The problem with that, obviously, is you're just going to spin your wheels. You're going to, the search is going to go on forever, right? The average search in the U.S. can easily take three, four months. You could double that if you don't know what you're looking for because you keep restarting. You get a bunch of false starts. The other issue is that all the interviewers don't agree up front on what it is we're looking for. So I'm looking for this. He's looking for that. And because we can't agree, the search can take forever. But most importantly, the biggest issue with this problem is that we don't stop to think about what is necessary for success in this particular role. 
A product manager is not a product manager is not a product manager. It's just as a software developer is not a software developer and on and on and on. Because as your company evolves and grows, even within a role, even within a department, jobs change. The needs of the business evolve. And it's important to, to stop, stop and think about what is going to be required for success in that role and develop a scorecard around it. You develop a scorecard so everyone's on the same page. We're looking for the same thing. I will not let my team start interviews until we've agreed on a scorecard. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes getting that agreement is not easy, but it saves you so much time. It's a little bit of, little bit of uh, go slow to go fast. Okay. Now, you see on the, on the page there, four interviewers. This is going to blow your mind. Four interviewers is the right number. For so many years, people have wondered, including me, what is the right number of interviewers? Should I put it people through two interviews or 20 interviews? And, you know, I'd be curious, kind of type, in fact, type in the chat box, how many interviews or how many interviewers see a typical candidate at your company? Just type the number. Let's just, just for, for kicks. I'm just kind of curious to see. I've seen everything up to maybe 20 interviewers over the course of my career. Imagine trying to get 20 people to agree on anything, much less, a, the right candidates. So I see two to four, two to three, three. I see pound sign. That's interesting. Uh, three. So, okay. So the good news is it doesn't sound like as a, as a group we're suffering too much from this one, but getting them to agree up front, sitting down in a room or on a call and beating through the scorecard is important. Why is four the right number? Google did a study as Google always does. And they found that four is the optimal number over four. If you go to five, for example, with some of you, you only get 1% more accurate. So four is the optimal number relative to time invested for interviewing a candidate. Let's go to deadly sin number two, focusing on things that are not predictive of success. Maybe you make some of these mistakes or maybe some of your coworkers make these mistakes, focusing on things that have no bearing. So what companies this candidate worked for, what their title was, how much they make, uh, their education. Obviously, a lot of people focus on good looks and charm and a warm handshake and, and, and just gut feel. That's not predictive. All kinds of things that people focus on. I want you to think about DNA. Let's talk about what that is. Just as we all have a physical DNA that determines our thinning hairline or brown eyes or height, whatever it may be, we also have a personal DNA. It determines our personality. It determines our drive, our behavior, our performance. And scientists tell us that it's pretty well baked by age eight. In other words, by age eight, you are the person you're gonna, gonna be. You know, maybe you're creative or musical or talented at, at looking at numbers or detail oriented or a dreamer, whatever it may be. We have a DNA and the DNA while we can change some things about ourselves, we can work at a company or go to a school, whatever, our DNA is hugely predictive for long-term sustained success in a career path. And most companies don't stop and think about that. I'm not referring to culture and culture fit, although that's important, not hugely predictive either, somewhat predictive, but DNA, getting at the person's underlying traits and characteristics. Now, the tricky part is you can't sit in an interview and say to the candidate, well, tell me about your DNA. I'll think you're nuts. But in a few minutes, we'll talk about how to get at that. But this is deadly sin number two, is focusing on all these things that are not predictive. Biggest example I can think of is industry experience, right? I, I need to hire a sales rep, so I'm gonna hire an industry uh, expert. Obviously, on the margin, industry experience is great. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that, assuming they don't have a non-compete, which is a whole nother webinar. But it's not sufficient in and of itself, maybe with a few exceptions, very arcane type of biotechnologies, et cetera. But, but for the most part, if you hire the right person, they can learn the industry. They can't learn the competencies and DNA that you need them to have for success. Uh, I had a conversation literally this morning with a guy who runs a very, very successful real estate company. He's having massive recruiting problems because he keeps recruiting the same people from the same industry. He called them retreads like a tire. And People it, over and over and over make this mistake, hiring people from the industry or worse, hiring people just like themselves. Okay, let's go to deadly sin number three. 
So now we know what we're looking for. That's, that's a huge, huge start that most people don't do. What most hiring managers do is put together some kind of really crappy job description. I mean, really crappy. If you go to a job board and you read, read you know, for, screw the job board, look at your own job descriptions. I can guarantee that some of them are boring or restrictive. They do nothing but turn off prospective candidates. You have to remember candidates for the most part are not, not even candidates, they're prospects, right? We don't even know if they're, if they're interested in having a, a discussion. But most companies' job descriptions certainly will not compel them. Have your VP of marketing, not your VP of HR, write job descriptions. I've hired professional copywriters to write job descriptions that will bring you to tears or make you laugh and make you say, oh my God, I gotta talk to this company. What most companies do is write a boring bullet point job description that lists in bullet point form 50 requirements that have nothing to do with success in the job anyway, as we've discussed with sin number two. But here's the scary thing that you may not know. Most people, especially women, will not apply to a job when they do not feel like they meet all the requirements. Part of that is they're busy, but bigger, they are they don't want rejection. Who wants to apply to a job knowing they're gonna be rejected? So they move on. Almost 100% of women, 100% won't even apply unless they think that they meet the criteria. So candidates take these really literally. The hard part is your company is probably saying five to eight years of experience in this or eight to 10 years of experience in that, not even predictive. But more importantly, if I've showed you someone who is seven years experience or 11 years experience, whatever, would you really not talk to that person? So job descriptions are a big problem. What successful companies do is develop a job invitation. It is a simple, doesn't have to be long, engaging, well-written uh, uh, document that compels rock stars to have a conversation. It doesn't even say, uh, uh, you know, much about the job. It's more about the opportunity, the career path, the company, right? And, and compels them to have a discussion. And one of you, JR, raises a great point uh, about using the words guru or rock star or things like that in the title. Totally agree. Uh, it will turn some people off. I never use the word rock star, almost never, when, when recruiting in an actual position, right? That's the title of my book and title of the webinar, but that's not a job title, right? It's a shortcut for a top 5% performer. And then you're inviting people to up to to just talk, right? It's not apply here. Rock stars don't click to apply here. They want to talk. They want to have a very discreet, confident conversation. Okay, so that is deadly sin number three. Let's move on to number four. You've got this job description, which we've already agreed is probably pretty weak, and then most companies just post and pray. What do I mean? They post it on some some job board and hope that it brings in the right people. There's a bunch of problems with that. Number one, there's 10,000 job boards in the US, so which ones do you use? Number two, most people aren't looking for a job. So they're not going through the job boards anyway. So job boards work really well in times of high unemployment, five, 10, 15% unemployment, you'll get flooded. But they don't work right now. now. I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying relying on them is not sufficient. So what smart companies do is is network, and I know that sounds cliche, but let me tell you what I mean specifically. An employee referral program that is well-designed and well put in place should deliver 50% of your hires, at least 50%. For most companies, it's about 20%, and that's if they have a program at all. One third of companies don't even have an employee referral program. But for most, it's, it's not even half as successful as it should be. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that we're not going to get into right now. But I can tell you one of them is not, I can't afford to pay my employees uh, a big referral fee. Again, Google did a big study and they were at $2,000 per referral. They went to 4,000, doubled it, no difference at all in the number of referrals. So how much you can afford to pay your people, whether it's a hundred bucks, I've seen some that are uh, uh, 10 or $20,000, doesn't matter. What matters is that you develop a well-articulated, fun, creative, engaging program. You keep it in front of your employees. You have your CEO behind you and you drip on it every month. In fact, every couple of weeks. And you tell them which roles you're having the most trouble filling and make it very clear what it is you're looking for, those DNA, a scorecard. And you'll be surprised 
what rolls in. Very, very effective, but it's a huge issue, much better than relying on post and pray. Why don't you type in the chat box, do you have an employee referral program that's delivering 50% of your current hires, not candidates, but actual hires? I told you this was simple, but not easy. This stuff is, is you know, I'm not gonna tell you it's rocket science, but if you're relying on posting and praying in a job market with this kind of unemployment rate, it's not gonna happen. Now, Debbie says 80%, that's the highest I've ever heard. Debbie, you should be running the webinar, that's amazing. James, 30%, 25%. So d definitely there's upside improvement. We should all talk to Debbie on what she's doing, but. You know, this is a huge, this is a game changer. And in addition, using LinkedIn the right way, most people use it the wrong way, uh, is another huge way, okay? There's a question, how do, how do you manage referrals from those that are not in the 50% of employees that are not working out? You, you treat those that referrals the same way. As soon as you stop uh, uh, treating these referrals like gold, these, these have to go to the top of the stack and the onus is on you or your HR team to treat them as such. The very, very first candidates you talk to are the employee referrals. Even if on paper you're like, ugh, waste of time. You owe it to your employees to invest the time with that candidate, and P.S., you might be surprised because resumes and interviews are notoriously not predictive, and your employee knows something about this individual that says they're worth talking to. Now, if you turn it into a black hole and you don't follow up with candidates, you will never get another referral from that employee again. So if you're getting it from employees that aren't working out, you got a different issue. You need to get rid of that employee. Uh, another question, what is the optimal referral fee to pay? Does it matter? Uh, it doesn't matter. Again, the studies show the more you pay, you know, I suppose the better, but you don't have to pay a lot. What's far more important is the frequency and creativity of the program. It's a marketing program. Again, your head of marketing should own this, right? It's a campaign. How much you pay is 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 irrelevant. One thing, and I point this out in, in the book, is that some companies pay different amounts for different roles. I, you know, it's a religious issue, I guess. I am strongly against that. I think paying one amount for a software developer and one amount, amount less for a marketing person sends entirely the wrong message to the organization. Um, that's your problem, that's not their problem. And so don't send the message that some people are worth twice as much as others. Let's keep rolling, we're almost halfway there, if you can believe it, and we're right on track, we're just at the bottom of the hour. Before we move on, here's the funnel that I have found over 25 years of experience and a lot of gray hair, and I've actually showed this to a lot of friends that work in recruiting, and in general, these seem to be about the numbers. So I typically start by looking at 150 people for a given role. I will quickly get that down to 20 people. 20 people that I choose to invest my time with. It's all time management and it's basically a sales funnel. Once I get to 20 people, I'm gonna assess them to get to five people uh, that are really worth drilling into and then, and then I vet those five candidates. Those five vetted candidates should produce two great people two great finalists. Ideally, when I work with my clients, my goal is to find not one, but two people that are so good, that the client says, I, I don't know who to pick, right? They're, they're so good. That is a great problem to have, because now you have a backup if your first choice doesn't take the position for whatever reason, which we'll get to uh, in deadly sin number nine, okay? So that's, that's the funnel. You're generally gonna see that. So if you're only looking at four people, you're not looking at enough right? Uh, unless you just get lucky and luck is not a strategy. If you're looking at a thousand people, you're probably looking at too many. And I've seen all types of issues with the recruiting funnel at most companies. So just think about that, share that with your team uh, to start thinking about it. Okay. Let's go to deadly sin number five. Probably the most common is crappy interviews. So you've all been candidates before. I'm sure you've interviewed for jobs. And if you think about the poor interview experiences you've had along the way, right? Poor interview questions, process, the whole thing is just a waste of time. Now, interviews are, are not that predictive of success anyway. I'm not saying don't do them. You have to do them, obviously, to get down the funnel. But 
asking random questions that are irrelevant, not predictive of success, and then not structuring the questions appropriately is what most people do. And again, leads to a 50% accuracy in hiring. If you ask the right questions in the right structure and you ask them of each and every candidate, which I know is not especially exciting for you, it's not entertaining, but it, interviews are not about being entertained, you can dramatically improve the, predict, the predictive factor of the interview. Let me give an example. If I don't, so, so if I don't ask the same questions of most candidates, how can I possibly compare candidate to candidate, which is the whole purpose of the process to find not just the best candidate, but the lowest risk candidate. So most people will ask random unstructured questions, different questions of different people, making it very hard to compare and contrast candidates. Further, within a candidate over the course of an hour or two, as you're asking questions, asking the same questions over and over and over for each role that they've held within reason, and I've got some, some thoughts on that, uh, I can almost plot their career on paper. It's almost like a stock chart. I can see that this person's career is going up or it's going down or it's flatlined or whatever it may be, right? If I don't ask structured questions, I have difficulty forming that pattern. And I'm looking to buy a stock when it's going up, not when it's going down. So unlike most people who buy stocks when they're going down, when they're going down, they usually keep going down. And, and candidates are the same way, right? I want someone who's on whose arc of their trajectory is really starting to, to increase. So actually in the book, I actually go through the actual questions. I'll actually give them to candidates in advance. There's no trick questions. There's no surprise. Now, I certainly drill into and ask the question how a lot, right? So how'd you do that? Well, how'd you do that? And how'd you do that? Most people take very surface level answers in an interview. Uh, there's a question from JR. Uh, is there a better starting point than a resume, video applications, Q&A? You know, so the question is to, to figure out to go from 20 people down to five or 150 down to 20. You start with whatever you got, right? Uh, sometimes you'll have a resume. Sometimes you may just have their LinkedIn profile. Sometimes you'll have not much. Uh, when you have an employee referral saying this person's a rock star, that's obviously all you need. Um, video applications, I'm, I'm kind of mixed on, right? I have, I have, I've done a few podcast episodes with CEOs of these video companies and they're good and bad to those two. You get, you got to have just have a starting point because you got to filter the 150 down to a manageable number as quickly as you can. I guess in general, you know, LinkedIn has become, um, a, a pretty effective way to do that. And I think candidates are becoming more sophisticated about their LinkedIn profiles. Okay. Let's go to deadly sin number six. So we've done the interviews. Okay, here's one of the biggest problems. This is gonna blow your mind. And 91% of companies skip this step entirely. They go right to number seven. So there's a nine out of 10 chance that you're probably making this mistake. And the mistake is not including a test drive. Now, some people call it a dry run, a job audition, a short-term gig, whatever, right? But this has been proven in studies to be the single most predictive thing in recruiting. More predictive than reference checks, more predictive than GPA or industry experience, more predictive than interviews. You could actually skip the interviews, but don't skip this step, the test drive. So what is the test drive? The test drive is a two hour to two day uh, process where you see the candidate in action. You see the candidate doing something that mirrors or is pretty close to what the final job will actually look like. If they're assembling widgets on assembly line, have them assembled widgets, right? It doesn't matter how they did in the interview and the resume if they can't actually have the manual dexterity. If it's a CFO, have them review your numbers from last quarter and do a presentation. Uh, have them put together the board deck for next quarter. If it's a head of sales, right? Have them review all the sales numbers and interview some of the sales reps and tell you their assessment of what some of the problems are. So there's no job that I've seen that I can't come up with a test drive. The book again goes through how to do that. And you can't do it for every candidate because it does take a good example. JR has got a great example, a hackathon, great example for software developers. You actually see a work product in action. Now, a lot of people skip this step because they say, you know, I don't want to turn off candidates. I don't want candidates, uh, you know, saying I'm trying to get free labor. 
And I don't care about free labor. Pay the people if you have to. It's worth 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 500 bucks. You'll, you'll avoid one mistake. It's, it's so worth it. And I recommend doing the final test drive for, uh, or doing a test drive for the final two or three candidates before you make your decision. You will be blown away. I did one of these a couple of weeks ago. One of my clients was hiring a head of operations. We had, we set it structured kind of a three or four hour working session with the, uh, with the team and they got to see him in action. He was a great thinker, but so annoying. They said they would kill him within the first week. So it became a really, you know, something that wasn't revealed in the interviews, wasn't revealed in the resume, wasn't revealed in his, the schools he went to. This guy was just annoying and for a bunch of reasons that I, I, I won't belabor, but uh, great, great technique is the test drive. Type in the chat box if you're doing test drives today for every role in your company before you extend an offer. I'm just curious uh, how pervasive this is. In the meantime, Jim's asking, what's a good test drive for software sales? Giving a presentation? It depends. You've got to really think about the scorecard, which is based on what the role is all about. If in that job they're going to be doing a lot of presentations, then that's a pretty good one, right? But if they're going to be uh, fielding inbound calls, then that's a good one, right? So it really depends, but do it for every role. And it is, you don't have to reinvent this. It, it works really well because you, you develop it and then refine it a little over time. But for every job, you take it out of the drawer and you're like, here's our, here's our test drive. And there, there's a chapter in the book that walks you through how to do it. There's companies that will do this for every position that they ever hire. And it is a game changer. Okay, let's go in the interest of time to deadly sin number six. Well, I talked about that, 91%, skip that step. Okay, deadly sin number seven, here we go. Probably your favorite, I know it's not mine. Reference checks, who likes reference checks? Reference checks are vital because you gotta validate the information you've been told, right? You've only heard one side of the story from the candidate. The test drive is more important than references. So if you're gonna skip one, skip the references and do the test drive because you'll see the person in action. But it's hugely important to talk to people that have worked with the individual. Here's the problem. Make sure you check the references before you make your decision. If you've already made your decision, you're wasting your time on references. Don't even do it. Maybe you're doing it to cover your ass with HR or whatever, but it's a waste of time. You do it before you make the decision and again, Sometimes before you, when you have your final two candidates, the references can be the tiebreaker. Make sure you talk to the right people, however, and that is not the references that the candidate is giving you. Of course, you'll talk to them, but more importantly, you'll talk to backdoor references. So there's front door references, the three or four or five people that the candidate gives you. Backdoor references are people you find on LinkedIn who know you and know the candidate, and you'd be shocked at how easy it is to find them. They might be uh, customers, they might be vendors, they might be, uh, you know, uh, people that, that, that the person went to school with, but you can find them. And it's totally fair game. It's totally legal. Of course, you'll be discreet and you'll find the most amazing truths that come out of those backdoor references. Now, there's a couple questions. Uh, what's the optimal type and number of reference checks? The right number of reference checks is as many as you can possibly do, right? So if I can do 20, I'll do them. Because again, as an executive recruiter, and I guarantee my hires for 12 months, I can't afford a bad hire because I have to redo that whole search. So that extra reference check to, to just have belt and suspenders is hugely valuable. I would guess after five or six, you're starting to hear the same things again and again. Certainly two or three is probably not enough. Um, and absolutely not via email. People will not put it in writing. It's gotta be uh, on the phone, if not in person. Um, Okay, let's keep going in the interest of time. So references, and then number eight, it's time, you've made a decision. It's time to make an offer. Who should make the offer? The HR department, or an outside recruiter like me, or the actual hiring manager? Most of my clients tell me, well, Jeff, why don't you do it? And I say, I'm happy to do it, but it means a whole lot less coming from me than it means coming from the hiring manager who can make a personal and passion plea that they want to have this person on their team. I want you on my team. I'm inviting you to join our family. It is so much more engaging. Who doesn't want to feel wanted and engaged that way versus hearing it from HR or from a headhunter or, or, or other person. Start with a verbal offer. 
then negotiate, get everything worked out, and then send the letter, which has no surprises in it. Most letters I see have some surprise. They've changed the title, they've changed the comp, they've changed the start date, they changed something, and that just spooks the candidate. And the letter, by the way, shouldn't be dry. It's not written by legal or HR. It is an invitation to come join us. And here's the great things you're going to do. And here's the great benefits. Obviously, have your lawyer review it and don't make promises you can't keep. But even that letter should say, we want you on this team. Why is this important? B and C players don't care because they don't have options. So you want to get rock stars, which is the reason you, you're, you're spending the hour together. If you're going to play in this game of trying to recruit rock stars, you have to recruit them. That's the emphasis. And you can't just email them a letter, right? You call them and you personally invite them or even better yet over dinner and tell them the great news. Then find out where there's any disconnects. There shouldn't be many. Okay. And then put it in writing. When you put it in writing, I use exploding offers. That's controversial. I understand highly controversial. The reason I use exploding offers, offers that expire in 36 hours, is because I always have a backup candidate. And I'm not going to afford losing my, I'm not going to risk losing my backup candidate if the first individual, first choice can't make the decision. So by now, if they can't decide they want to join us, that's totally fine. It's cool. Move on to number two. If you don't have a backup candidate, then the exploding offer is much more risky. I understand that. One last thing uh, on this point, and then I'm going to take a, a sip of water. Um, avoid compensation surprises and do that by asking current compensation on the very first conversation. So way back in the process, before we even got to sin number two, you should already know what the candidate is making today. And if you think people won't tell you, you're wrong. 99% of people will. The book actually has the exact wording of the questions that I ask. And I'm happy to give, you know, give, give those words to you. Okay. So that said, I'm going to take a sip. Uh, who is, who, tell me in, in the chat box, are your hiring managers making the offers or are your HR or recruiters making your offers? We're right on track. We got 15 minutes left and we got two sins left and then some Q and A. And then I have a free, uh, a free prize for you guys. Okay. So hiring managers, great. Hiring managers, HR. Okay. James, I appreciate you being honest. Hiring managers, recruiters. Yep. So think about recruiting as sales and marketing and think about the prospective hire as a customer because recruiters are, because they got choices just like customers. Who would you rather hear from? Would you rather hear from the hiring manager or how would you, or would you rather hear from HR who, by the way, can't probably can't answer. And this is nothing against HR. HR people add a ton of value to the process, but even HR people will tell you that the hiring manager will have more success if they make the offer themselves. And then HR people, uh, hiring managers say, I'm too busy or I'm traveling. And, I, and I'm like, what's more important than recruiting great talent to your team? So I don't, I don't quite get that. Uh, Kapil has a question how to best ask the current compensation. Uh, if we have time, we'll get to that. Otherwise, uh, you'll find it in the book. Uh, but let's keep going. Number nine. Okay, this is a huge mistake. I bet you might have made this. We hire rock stars, right? They're great people. They're really talented. They're super smart. They went to a great school. So onboarding, they don't need onboarding. Let's dump them in the pool by day two. So onboarding effectively looks like fill out these forms on day one. Bob's taking you to lunch. Here's the bathroom. Uh, your, congratulations, you've been onboarded. Huge, huge, huge mistake. Why is it a huge mistake? Even rock stars need time to ramp. They're, they're merging onto a highway. The highway is moving at 70 miles an hour, right? And you got this, this merge, right? They need time to ramp up. Now, they don't need forever, and rock stars will certainly ramp faster than others. So you're paying a little bit more for a rock star, perhaps but they're gonna ramp way faster than a B or C player who may never ramp at all. The first 30 days, you gotta get right. I, I implore you to read the book, uh, The First 90 Days, which is written by my friend, Michael Watkins, who's a phenomenal Harvard professor, a former Harvard professor. I actually have a podcast coming out with him in a couple of weeks. And then admit to yourself the mistakes you've made and remove those people within 60 days. It's usually 30. 
but I can't come up with any reason to wait past day 60. You know you've made a mistake. They know you've made a mistake. Your whole team is telling you you've made a mistake, and yet you don't make the change. So you, you, if you're going to have an 80% accuracy, which is far better than average, you're going to have two out of every 10 hires you make are a mistake. And you probably know it within a couple of weeks. You'd be very honest with them. Obviously, they may be in the wrong role. So if you have the ability, maybe you hired someone who you thought was a hunter. It turns out they're a really good farmer. Redeploy them into that role. You've already spent, think of the sunk cost you've spent in recruiting and engaging and getting them on board. And they love your company and your mission. They're just in the wrong seat on the bus. So get them into the right seat. Otherwise, they need to be removed from the bus. There's a question uh, from Cameron. How does a test drive get a, give a good indication without the ability to ramp up? Great question. So the test drive obviously is, is has to be realistic. So you can't have, no, I shouldn't say you can't. I've heard of companies that have a 30 day test drive. I understand the concept. I think we all live on a 30 day test drive because our bosses can remove us at any time for any reason whatsoever. So I kind of think we all live on a 30 day test drive, but you want to get a reasonable glimpse of the person's performance. And so you need to kind of contain that test drive to the time allowed, whether it's a couple hours, a couple days. I've seen some over the course of a week. Uh, we did a CFO search recently, gave last quarter's numbers to the candidate, we prepared the deck, the whole VC presentation. There's no reason a CFO shouldn't be able to do that within, within a week. He doesn't need to know our company inside and out and our industry. He just needs to understand the numbers and, 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 and the financial structure. Again, you're not looking for perfection in the test drive. You're looking for how they think, the questions they ask, their attention to detail. Frankly, can they even follow instructions? And, 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 and so, so that's my best answer, Cameron. Let's move on to deadly sin number 10, the biggest one, the last one. Treating rock stars the same as everyone else. Think about how crazy it is to go through all this hassle, recruit rock stars, pay a little bit more, interview a lot of candidates, get them on board, spend all this time, read this whole book, and then treat them like everyone else. I'm not saying treat rock stars as special because of ego or prima donnas. Not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that rock stars care about different things than BNC players. I'm sure you're all rock stars, so think about it. They care about challenge more than money. Would you believe that studies show that rock stars care more about being challenged than about money? Now, obviously, they have to be well compensated, right? I'm not saying you can take advantage of them. I actually have found that 75th to 80th percentile is where you want to be in terms of compensation. You don't need to be at the top of the market, but you do need to provide a great challenge, a great career path, upside, Bridge the gap on compensation with creative upside compensation if you have to, equity or cash or some combination. Could be vacation time. Maybe you can't afford them full time. Get them four days a week and give them Fridays off. They're still going to be more productive than a B player would be in six days a week. And candid coaching, especially with millennials, can, candid coaching is vital for rock stars. So let me just give you a visual, and this will stick with you, I promise, the rest of the day. This is what most managers do. It happened two weeks ago, probably at, at most companies, right? Annual salary increases. What am I going to do? CFO told me I can go from 1% to 5%. So I take peanut butter and I spread it and everyone gets 3% and my, my job is done. Well, I guess that worked, right? Except the rock stars feel like crap. They're totally underappreciated. They busted their ass. They made huge differences. They grew the business by 50% and they got a 3% raise. The B and C players got a 3% raise. They should have got nothing because they didn't deliver as much to the company, right? So what I'm proposing is give the Bs and Cs 0% increase and give 20% increase to your A players. Now, I know those numbers don't add up. We're not going to get into it on this call, but in my Kellogg class, I teach a mathematical way to kind of think about this. But the point is differentiation. Read Jack Welch. Differentiate your A players, your rock stars, your top 5 10% people need to get a disproportionate amount of your time, your attention, your money, your rewards, your promotions, your dream jobs. Most people spend 50, 80% of their time babysitting, micromanaging, coaching their B and C players. You got to flip that upside down. And I hope you'll do that in 2018. Okay, so we've gone through this process. It's not rocket science. I said at the, at the onset, it's simple but not easy, right? You don't have to master the world all in one day. Take one area with your company. Figure out where you think you're falling down. Maybe you don't have a test drive in place. I'd probably start there. 
Teach your, your hiring managers how to ask the right questions. Stop just posting and praying on job boards. And for God's sakes, stop using the peanut butter approach with all your, with all your talent, okay? Now, I promised you, I promised you, I'm not gonna try to sell you a book here. I know that's what you're thinking. How many of you, type in the chat box, how many of you think I'm gonna try to get 15 bucks out of you for a book? Just type yes or no. I'm just kind of curious. I have a feeling that's what you're thinking, but I've got a surprise for you. This is gonna blow your mind. This book, I've been like very humble because the response has been great. Uh, some of you were saying, no, you'd like to give it to me. That's very funny, JR, thank you. Um, Five-star reviews on Amazon. Um, it was a best-selling book the day it came out on Amazon. Um, Dick Costolo, who's a friend of mine who used to run Twitter, uh, loved the book. You know, he said he read it one weekend and loved it. And, um, and and ignore the advice at your own peril. You know, Dayton Ogden, who at six billion dollar Summit Partners private equity firm, said if you read one book this year to grow your company, this is it. Recruit rock stars. Brad Feld, one of the top venture capitalists in the country says that this book will show you how to do it if you're leading a growth company. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm giving you the book. Because you sat through this webinar, you, you get it free. I'm just gonna give it to you. Now, here's the, the website you gotta write down. Tinyurl, tinyurl.com slash free rock stars. The book is completely free. The Kindle edition you'll get as long as you order it uh, on Amazon, and this is the link that'll take you right there, uh, by Friday. You can download it for free. The Kindle version is normally 10 bucks. You're gonna get it for zero. There's also the hard copy and paperback if, if you wanna get those. But here, but I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna beg you for one small favor. Help me get the word out. Spread the word. Give this same URL on social media, if you can put it on LinkedIn, tweet it, tell them people you were on the webinar and it wasn't a waste of your time and they can get the book and it's gonna take them through the whole enchilada and it's gonna give you the interview questions, the reference questions, everything I know of 25 years I poured into this thing. It's exact same stuff I teach at Kellogg uh, Business School. But I'm, I'm asking you as a favor, if you could share this with your team, your boss, et cetera, uh, I'd, I'd be most, most grateful. In addition to the book, uh, I've got a, a great podcast. Again, it's five-star reviews on the iTunes store. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I, I interview a phenomenal expert on recruiting, venture capitalists, private equity investors, CEOs, heads of HR. Um, I've got one coming out uh, with, with David Allen, the legendary author of, of um, uh, 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 just a, a legendary book that goes through getting things done, uh, GTD. Uh, you know, millions and millions of readers. And he takes us through how do you decide when to delegate and how do you decide when to do something, right? So just great, great guest. And I hope you'll subscribe. It's 20 minutes, really easy. And uh, and you can join the podcast. In the meantime, oh, there's a question. It seems like you have to have a Kindle membership to access the book. No, you don't. You, do, you need a uh, an Amazon uh, membership, but the Kindle is is free. If you don't have a Kindle, it, it, you don't have to have a Kindle. You can read Kindle format now on a Kindle app on your phone. I read books all the time on this thing. Uh, you can get a Kindle for your iPad. And if none of those work, send me an email. I'll email you the PDF. So here's my email address, jeff at strongsuit.com. I'm on a mission to help companies with no bad hires. If you have any questions at all, I'm happy to help you. And so with that, let's go to q and I'm happy to... Take some of your questions. We've got four minutes left. I promise we'll be done by 59 minutes after the hour. Just type in the chat box. And I hope you found this really useful. I hope you found the 10-step process useful. During 2018, just pick one of them over the next few weeks and work with your team on just that one. Take one baby step. Maybe it's the test drive. Maybe you're doing the test drive. I think some of you said you were. In which case, focus on the interview questions. That's chapter five in the book. And the book will take you through um, everything you need to know um, uh, for your team. But you gotta download it by Friday. That's the only catch. There's a, it's a long story, but there's a deadline of Friday. So please take that, that URL. I'm gonna show up on the screen one more time. 
while we're talking. How long should a typical search take, according to Tim? So it depends on the level of the position. Executive search, the field I work in, on average takes 120 days, uh, 90 to 120 days, so three to four months from the time you say go. I actually guarantee my clients 60 days. Um, part of that is because I only take on a few searches at a time, so I have more bandwidth per search. But junior level searches should take, you know, two, four, six weeks. Uh, so it, it really depends on the level of the search, Tim, or you know, level of the, of the position. But the biggest issue, regardless of the, the of the search, is not knowing what you want up front. And then you get all these false starts, and it's back to square one, back to square one, back to square one. That's what causes searches to go from two months to three months to four months, uh, et cetera. Okay, we have time for another question. If you just type in the chat box, uh, I'm happy to answer it for you. And then you can just go grab the book, totally free, uh, Recruit Rockstars. Okay, no other questions. I'm sure you have a ton but the book is going to answer them. And you've got my email address, jeff at strongsuit.com. I wish you the best in 2018. Uh, you know, I hope it's just a great year for you. And if there's anything I can do to be helpful, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I wish you the best. Have a great day.